people in the congregation here and to those of you who are watching online. It is a Harrow tradition to begin our services with hymns chosen by members of the congregation. This week, Judy McDuff has made the choices. You can remain seated for these selections. The first choice is number 27 for more voices, Creator God, You Gave Us Life. The second hymn, also for more voices, is number 161, I Have Called You By Your Name. Karen Corbett, and I am one of the lay leaders here at Harrow. Leanne Delkey is our pianist, and Will Jones will be reading scripture. Uh, I beg your pardon. 
uh, Dorothy Froman will be reading scripture. Madeline Corbin and Sarah Sherbo are providing our tech support this morning. Our guest minister this morning is Reverend Don McKay. Don was born and raised in Winnipeg and was a member of Gray Street United Church. He has ministered throughout the prairies and Ontario and interned in the clinical pastoral education in North Dakota. Don also did specialized counseling training at the Toronto Institute of Bioengenic Analysis. He and his wife Marilyn had two sons and have two granddaughters who they don't get to see enough of. Don is an avid walker, having completed parts of the Camino de Santiago, the Saints Way in Cornwall, and St. Olaf's Way in Northumberland. Welcome to Harrow. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Grace and welcome to you if this is your first visit with Harrow or your 101st visit. Welcome to you if you are young or old or a little bit of each. Welcome to you if you are rich or poor. Welcome if your skin tone is black or white or brown or a little bit of each. Welcome if you are gay or straight, cis or bi, queer or questioning. Welcome if you are doubting or believing or a little bit of each. Grace and peace to all this day. And if you will join me in the land acknowledgement as printed on the screen. In the presence of Creator God, we acknowledge that we gather on Treaty One land, the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota nations, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In hope, we work and pray for justice and for reconciliation. And moving on to the announcements. Um, this Friday will be the uh, frozen soup sale, so pre-order your soups by emailing uh, Shirley May. And the next council meeting is uh, via, via Zoom is scheduled for November 27th at 7 p.m. And on November 29th is the next meeting of the, also via Zoom, the Faithful Readers Book Club, The Diamond Eye uh, is the book that we are reading this month. Next Sunday, we will be at the Parkway service, and service is at 10.30, and the worship committee will, be, will meet after the service. And on Sunday, December 3rd, at, at Harrow, there, uh, there will be the Advent Messy Church, the, uh, the Messy, which starts at 4 p.m., and there's also a congregational potluck after the Messy Church at 5, and we'll be meeting in the lower hall for that. I now invite you to take a deep breath, to release any tension or distractions that you may be carrying, and to center yourself in God, and God present here and everywhere, and within you as we listen to some music and prepare for warm, formal worship.
morning. It's good to be here. I don't know whether the mic is working or not. It's working. It's really interesting. Did you know that the church is really a small world? Anybody ever been here to a place called Berryfield, Saskatchewan? Anybody? God, three of us. Turns out, I was talking to a gentleman earlier before the service started, he's from Berryfield. He said, Oh, I have a friend from there. Oh, he said, What's his name? I said, Oh, oh I know, he's just moved to Toronto. Oh. The church is small. We are connected with people from everywhere and anywhere. And that's kind of the neat thing. We're connected. We're part of a big family. We're very special, we're very unique, and we're very challenged. People are saying, oh, the church is in trouble right now. I don't think so. Uh, the church is where it's supposed to be, in people's hearts. And when it's in people's hearts, it starts to do stuff. It starts to do important things. It starts, starts to share, it starts to do something that Ministry. But that is ministry. I know they took him and hopped out in a full suit. That's ministry, friends. We do these things. Why do we do them? Because we're called to do them. Let us take a moment of silence to gather our hearts together and to share our thoughts and feelings as we enter this time of specialness, this time of of worship. We extol you, our God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Come, let us unite our hearts as we worship. Let us join together in the singing of hymn number 108 in Songs for a Gospel People, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness, 108. Okay. Oh. Different, different numbers in different books. Okay.
hearts in prayer. Let us say together our prayer of approach. Holy Friends, Lord, Lord, We have a couple of us really important people, which I refer to as VIKs, here this morning. Very important kids. And I'm only. This is Savannah, and this is one of her first times here since she was quite little. Oh, my turn. Well, my turn. I have to give you five now, don't I? Do you know what today is? Anybody got a, maybe we could ask these other big kids here if they know what today is. You know what today is? Sunday. Sunday? Sunday? Well, besides that. Great Cup Day. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it's Great Cup Day. And you know what I brought here? It's like it's a sweater or a t shirt. Oh. What the? Yeah. If I was to put this on right now, which I can't do because I mess up everything, but if I put it on, I'm putting on a skin, a t-shirt, and it's something that says to me and to all kinds of people that I'm a fan, that I'm a fan of the Blue Bombers. And I, I think I've seen another, somebody else still, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you ought to stand up, come on, this is, you know. Job. Yeah, there are, there are two great people in this church all of a sudden. <laughs> you put it on and it says to the world, we're fans. We're fans of a special group of individuals that have come to our city, that are part of our city, and we cheer them and we hope that they will do well today. But you and I also have another shirt on, and it's always on. And, that. and that's, that shirt is the shirt for skin of being a member of the family of Jesus Christ. And how did we know that that's, you know, we wear that day in and day out, when we share the good news, when we, we work for those who are in need, when we just witness being, a mem being the, about Jesus the Christ. That's what it is. That is our special and unique skin or shirt that we wear at all times. It says we are members of the family of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's interesting that Don told us that little story about wearing a special shirt to represent the bombers, because last week uh, the children made their own special anniversary shirts, and uh, Savannah wasn't here last week, and some of the other children that made theirs last week aren't here today, but Savannah's going to get to make her shirt. So when she's finished Sunday school today, she'll come and show you the shirt she oh, made. It's awesome. a special shirt that says Harrow, 107 years of sharing and caring. So she's going to get to do that with the fabric pens. Oh, and, uh, that's we'll, we'll get to see it a little bit later. Okay. So she'll have a second skin too. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Our hymn is number 605, 605 in Voices United.
problems. <laughs> Lessons from how we share. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've been staying with Susan for the last several days and we've had a wonderful time. So thank you for asking me to uh, read the scripture and that's to pray. In a word of so many voices, God, in a world of so many words, your word defines what is truly important. Help us to be open and to hear. Amen. The scripture today is Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. And thanks to Karen, I have the Good News Bible, today's English version, because the font is a little bit bigger, and I'm old. When the Son of Man comes in as king, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne and the people of all the nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the righteous people on his right and the others on his left. Then the king will say to his people on the right, Come, you that are blessed by my father. Come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you received me in your home, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, when, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you as a stranger and welcome you in our homes or naked and clothe you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those who are on the left, away from me, you that are under God's curse, away the eternal fire which is being prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you would not feed me. I was thirsty, but you would not give me a drink. I was a stranger, but you would not welcome me in your homes. Naked, but you would not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you would not take care of me. Then they will answer him, when, Lord, did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we would not help you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you refused to help one of these least important ones, you refused to help me. These then will be sent off to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to the eternal life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts united together to be true and honest worship unto you, O God. Amen. There's something terribly sad in today's Gospel reading. Something so easy to miss that it eludes most of us. That's probably because this is such a tempting story. It's one of the most straightforward of all the New Testament accounts of judgment, and one of the most fun. Here judgment is connected to actively reaching out to those in need, especially to the least of these, to those who are at the bottom, to at the bottom, the bottom, those who, those are the ones that are, are panhandling on our streets, living on the shores of the rivers, but they're actively, that's, here judgment is connected. Judgment is connected when we see those people coming up to us with a, a cup or a hand, saying, you got any spare change? We see that daily. My wife and I live downtown, and we see that day in and day out. People panhandling. We like to walk, so we walk often along the shores of, lake, of, the, of the rivers here. There's great walking paths there. And what do we see? We see little tents, usually out of some kind of blue, plasticky stuff. I don't know what it is. But we see them day in and day out. And we see lineups, lineups, when the Salvation Army comes along with their food van. And we see that day in and day out. We see the people at the bottom, those who are, are most helpless, those who have no other champions, to those with no one else to care for them. These are God's favorites, the one God sees in a special, special way. And it's really clear that those who are, are condemned, not condemned for doing bad things or, or acting unjustly or cruelly, Instead, they are condemned for the good they did not do. You can't sit out of the Christian moral life. There is just no way by avoiding engagement to thereby avoiding judgment. It's easy to say, I never intentionally hurt anybody. Anybody heard that? Yeah, we hear that a lot. I never intentionally hurted anybody. But that just doesn't cut the mustard at the great throne of judgment, all of which can tempt just about any clergy person to shout, so get out there and serve Jesus in your neighbor. Do good and save your soul from the judgment of, of eternal fire all at the same time, which can make a heck of a sermon. And what most church leaders aren't opposed to preaching from time to time. Good stuff, can't hurt. But today, let's talk. Let's talk about what is so sad in this story. Notice that those who have been gathered up at the right hand of the Lord, those who are called blessed of the Creator, the ones we want to be, have only one thing to say to Jesus. They say, Lord, when? When was it that we saw you hungry 
and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink. When? That's it. That's all they have to say. This is, this is dreadfully sad because of all the loss and all the struggle and all the pain, that question applies that these folks, the sheep, the radically changed, or to put it in a conservative way, saved the good guys. They were right. They did all of the correct things. But they missed, they missed the greatest joy of it. They missed seeing the Lord. They overlooked the hidden presence of God in the faces of those they served. One of the reasons we have, have this parable may be to help us avoid that loss, to remind us that, that reaching out and caring and serving can be a boat at the level of the greatest depth because it's very clear, very clear, no matter how right we are, no matter how much you serve the presence of Christ in others, you don't pay special attention if you simply don't look for the Lord Jesus and those you serve. Then, like the saved people in the parable, you won't see him. And most of the joy is lost. Most of the joy of doing good and being right, most of the joy, most of that joy, as I just said, is lost. After all, reaching out in love to the presence of Christ in others, especially in both the least of these and those closest to us. This is quite often a great big pain. It takes a lot of time, and there's almost never any indication that anything of lasting benefit has happened. What's more, the least of these are usually at least partially responsible for whatever problems and needs make them the least. And most of the time, they don't look or act or smell the way we imagine Jesus should. Frequently, they aren't very nice. And worse yet, they seem to, seldom seem to appreciate whatever good we try to do for them. So doing good, reaching out to feed, clothe, visit, heal, and otherwise minister to the least of these tends to frustrate us and we tend to get burned and get burned out. <clears throat> and much so, the same sort of thing can happen when the ones we reach out to are not some distant them, but instead the people we live with and around us, the people closest to us, one would think that actually serving Christ should be as hard and as disheartened as it often is. But there we are, after all. Just because we're doing something for religious reasons doesn't mean that all by itself, whatever we're doing will look or feel religious, or that it will, will affect us in a particular religious way. Cleaning the kitchen in the church, or wearing a mouth for that matter, is still cleaning the kitchen. Being nice to a difficult person because you are convinced that Jesus wants you to is still being nice to a difficult person. Spending time or money or energy out of Christian conviction still means that you no longer have that time or that money or that energy. The Lord calls us to serve him in our neighbors, in our brothers and sisters, in the least, in the least of these and often the most challenging in those close to us. The call is real. There are no excuses. But the Lord also calls us, the Lord also calls you and me to see him in the face of our neighbors and our brother and sister. And we can't forget, in the least of these, this is a, a spiritual call, a call to discernment as much as it is a call to action and service. There's not a secret 
a mysterious way to this. There's no, it's not a big secret, it's not mystery, there's no mystery how to do this. But here are two quick ideas how to do it. First of all, in order to see the Lord, you have to look at the people around us, deliberately, all of the time. We need constantly to look as we remember what we are doing, why we are doing it, and what we hope to come from it. We need to look on purpose. Secondly, if we want Jesus to show himself to us, it can really help if we ask him to. Sometimes we have to ask him a lot. That's one reason why reaching out to others in a way that is not wrapped in prayer, any act of ministry that is not consciously and deliberately offered to God with the request to be shown how the Lord is in it, while certainly not wasted effort, is terribly, terribly incomplete. If our prayers during the day and about the day do not beg the Lord for a look of his face or a glimpse at his realm in all that is going on around us, then we're cheating. We're cheating ourselves and living barely on the surface of a much deeper reality. To try to live the life Christ calls us to live without placing all that in the middle of some discipline, reflection, prayer, and study. This is to risk missing the best part of it all. It is to risk missing the presence and word of Jesus that can transform a mundane task into an opportunity for insight and for joy. That can make doing the things we are called to do a deeper path into the mystery of God's life and of our own. The story of judgment is more than a call to serve and to do the right thing. Sure, it's that, but it's, it's more. It's much more. It's also a call to look, to notice, to devote our days and our lives in the search for the face of God in all that we do. It's a call, above all else, to see. Amen. Our hymn is number 612. There is a bomb in Gilead, 612.
Our tithes and offerings will now be presented. These gifts, O God, are gifts to you. They are gifts from us, but they are only a small token. They are a small token of what you have given to us. We try to give to you more and more. Be with us now, O God, now and always, as we witness to you in this community and throughout the world. Amen. And our hymn is number 543. We give you that language. Oh, it's spoke. Oh, okay. 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 Let us join together in these words. Forgive me, but thy name. Whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine own. I trust the Lord for me. May we have come to discuss as superstitious as you see this evening, and gladly we have sought the best. Let us unite our hearts together in prayer. Almighty God, we live in a world that is, is full of pain, full of violence, full of uncertainty. We read the newspapers and watch the TV news and we become afraid. Afraid of the violence, afraid of the disasters, Hear us, God. Comfort us. Support us. We ask that you, you be with the people of Gaza, the people of Israel, the people of Palestine. Help them to come to an understanding that violence does not do it, that only peace and justice and fairness does it. We ask, O oh God, that you be with those in our community who grieve, who are sorrowful, who have lost a loved one. Be with them. Be with them now and always as they remember their special and unique friend and relatives. We ask, O oh God, that you be with us as we struggle and strive to work for peace and justice in this community and around the world. Help us, God, to, to reach out to the least of these. Help us to to minister to them in your name. Help us to do those things. As we pray to you in silence, mentioning, mentioning the things known only to you and to us, as we pray in silence. Hear our prayer, O oh God. As we say together the prayer that your child Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I can be come. Thy will be done. Oh,
claim is number 120 in Voices United. O oh, Jesus, I have promised. suffering where God will make you go on all alone, and no joy that cannot be enriched by God's happiness with you. Two things to Christ, Christ who strengthens us. us. The love of Christ Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.